Thanks, Lynn, for sharing your garden with us. Uh, it's such a beautiful location, and uh, you're such a beautiful person, too. Thanks. Well, coming up next, we're going to be turning our attention to plants for shade, all different kinds of plants. John Houston from Tilly Street Plant Company is joining us, and it's great to have you back on the program. Thanks, Tom. Good to be back. Everybody's hungry for shade plants when they live in urban settings because we're all packed in around buildings and trees and uh, uh, you know, lots of hunger for, you know, uh, original new ideas when it comes to these things. One of the big questions a lot of people have is just creating screens in shade. And you've brought, we're going to start off with a plant that you brought that is uh, perfect for this. It's uh, one of the viburnums, right? It is. It's the uh, Sandanqua viburnum. And um, it's one of my favorites for something like this. So it's got a very nice dark glossy leaf. It usually gets to somewhere between 8 and 10 feet, depending on how much uh, Austin soil you have available for it to get to that size. But it's a lovely plant because it will take full shade. It can move into a bit of dappled sunlight. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with deep enough soil and just regular watering, uh, it really thrives here. It does quite well. It can produce a very nice dense shade for people and a nice screen for uh, privacy if that is always an issue in the city. It takes shearing. Um, it's, it grows tall. Uh, it's a plant that can work in a lot of different settings. Um, let's, it's probably a little bit deer resistant too, I would think. It is a lot of viburnums have yeah. that, that noxious uh, fragrance to them. It, it does. It has a slight fragrance. I don't know if it's <laughs> noxious. Uh, it is considered deer Mm -hmm. resistant that is the caveat that in austin mm -hmm. uh, you know you throw that out there and somebody will come in and tell you uh not in my neighborhood it's not right. so you know i think the deer have different tastes from one zip code to the next but right. that's one that we do kind of consider to be somewhat right. deer resistant so big dense shade it works and screening wonderful right. for that absolutely okay. Well, the next plant we're going to talk about is uh, one of the spireas. This is one called Anthony Waterer. This is kind of an old-fashioned plant in a way, but I really like the spireas. They're tough. They are quite tough. Um, you know, a wonderful interest throughout the year, too. They, this particular one puts on a really nice little cluster of pink flowers. Mm -hmm. They can handle quite a bit of dense shade and still flower quite nicely. Mm -hmm. If you prune them back after that first flowering, too, there's a good chance in the fall you'll get that second flowering also. Mm -hmm. The other nice thing is before they go dormant, they are a deciduous plant, but before they go dormant, their leaves turn a nice coppery reddish color, which really adds to a nice fall mm -hmm. attraction for them as well. Yeah. Not terribly tall, to about four feet, so they're not going to give you a big screen, but just a lovely little very reliable xeric blooming hedge. Right, and it's a nice counterpoint to uh, broader leaf things. It, it's Absolutely. got a nice fine texture. Absolutely. It works really well. Wonderful flower clusters. The firecracker ferns are the Rusalias, am I saying that right? Rusalia, yes, absolutely. Okay, um, this is a plant that uh, I love for hanging baskets in containers mm -hmm. or in the ground. Um, we've been familiar for a number of years with the orange uh, flowered form, mm -hmm. uh, really great. Um, but it, it, they now have this pale yellow form too, which I really love. I really like this also. They look very nice together. I haven't had any real issues with them crossing and turning a pale pink or going back to red. They seem to maintain their color right, uh, quite nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, the hummingbirds are just crazy for this plant. This is one that does quite well. It doesn't need a whole lot of sun. We've had really good success with it. Um, you know, just getting a little bit of morning sun. We still get great bloom clusters on it. Mm -hmm. The plants do tend to elongate a bit more, but really it seems to make the spilling effect much, much nicer. Now it will freeze to the ground in winter time. Depending on the on the circumstances, in a normal Austin winter, this tends to be evergreen. Mm -hmm. Normal uh, seasons seem to come and go. This right. last one was very hard on it, but it's one that seems to come back with a real vengeance. It comes back, you know, it'll die back to the ground in very cold winters, but comes back very, very hardy the next year. I've right. had this in my yard for years. It's never ever let me down. Always okay. comes back Good. very nice. Good. Well, uh, I'm, I know that a lot of people who garden in other parts of the country wonder where are our ewes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there are a handful that do uh, uh, produce and, and perform here in uh, Central Texas. The prostrate ewe is one of them. Tell me about this plant, because I honestly don't know much about it. This is a cephalotaxis, uh, the, the variety called Duke Gardens, where it was first originated. The best description I had for this ewe is imagine a full-size ewe that's been stepped on by an elephant. It doesn't get very <laughs> tall. It stays quite short to about 30 inches tall by about 60 inches wide. Mm -hmm. can handle very, very dense shade. It almost makes a, 
a very nice slightly elevated ground cover in a way it really mm -hmm. spreads out nicely very nice needle like green leaves on it i really love this plant i think this would look good in an oriental garden setting it's yeah. got a very nice structural very architectural structure to it i think it would look quite nice yeah and well anyway i love the, the texture of it and the fact that it gets so wide i didn't know that but that's really cool it really does yeah it's one of our favorite plants we've been putting this in quite a lot recently in some of our landscapes mm -hmm. around East Austin, and we've had really good success yeah. with it. It does require regular watering, mm -hmm. uh, and definitely not overwatering. but since it does tend to be in the shade, that's not quite so much of an issue with the drying. All right. Well, the soft leaf yucca is one that a, pe a lot of people will look at and say, that grows in the shade, but you see it mm -hmm. everywhere in the shade. You do. It is probably one of the most popular plants in Austin. The landscapers, the landscape community just absolutely love this plant because it is almost bulletproof mm -hmm. so long as you don't overwater it. Um, it is one that can go from a fair amount of sun to quite a bit of shade, and the shade makes it very nice because it doesn't tend to fade out the color of the leaf as much, mm -hmm. I think, when it's in some shade. A lovely cream, you know, uh, colored spikes of flowers on it in the summertime. Yeah. Just a beautiful plant. Not uh, not to worry about sharp edges here. This is a a quite a friendly it's, plant. It's a fairly friendly plant. It doesn't have the sharp edges on yeah. the tips of it, but it's one that we've often called a paper cut plant because uh, the, si the sides of the yeah. leaves are somewhat serrated and they will get after you if you, if okay, you run your so fingers careful along the when sides of it. Be careful when you're weeding, exactly, in other words. Exactly. Okay, all right. Well, it's a great plant. I love to see this in groups. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it looks really beautiful that way. But but it also serves as a great counterpoint to other fine textured plants like a spirea, for example. Exactly, and you that's know? something you can put down at the base of it. I mean, these do get to about six feet tall, so it makes right. a very nice structure behind something that may be a bit lower growing. Okay. Well, there's a plant that a lot of people like to use as a culinary plant called Ojo Santo, mm -hmm. or root beer plant, appropriately named. Tell me a little bit about this one. It's, this is a, a herbaceous uh, perennial here, and it is considered to be a culinary herb. Uh, but it makes an absolutely wonderful perennial plant here. Uh, it is known to be used as an herb. You know, people will wrap fish in it and cook it or wrap uh, beef or poultry. It leaves a very nice root beer flavor at the end. It's a lovely plant, but it does quite well as a recurring perennial here. The only mm -hmm. issue that some people have had with this is it can get a bit out of control if left for years and years. It does grow to about four feet. The mm -hmm. leaves can be, get to be over a foot wide each, and uh, it does spread underground, so it can get to be a bit much after okay. a few years, but it's not hard to control. Coloni it's one of my yeah, favorites. Uh, colonizers are good in the right situation. So if you have a, a big corner to fill and want something with bold texture, sounds like exactly. a great plant. Exactly, and it's a wonderful pass along plant too. It's very easy to propagate and give okay. to friends and neighbors. Cool, all right. Well, I love ferns, all different kinds, and you've brought two different ones here. One is called autumn fern which, uh, you know, is kind of a classic looking fern. Very uh, classic. You know, uh, nice and compact. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the growing conditions for this. This is a very compact fern. It's considered a dwarf fern. The name autumn fern is kind of strange for it because the show in this fern is really in the springtime. The new fronds emerge in the spring. They're a very nice coppery red color. Very nice show. Mm -hmm. uh, they do tend to, to fade to green as it goes through the season. And then late in the summer, you usually, if you look on the undersides of the leaves, they've got covered with little spores on For the sure. bottom side, which mm -hmm. are quite attractive. Yeah, a lot of people think they're insects. <laughs> yeah, I, would, I could see that they would think they would be right. insect eggs or something like but, that. But, there, but it is a beautiful fern. Now, I, I have to say that this is my favorite fern name of all time, the wavy scaly fern. <laughs> a wavy scaly cloak fern. Okay. Uh, love this plant. Very different texture, as you may have mm -hmm. noticed. When you touch it, it's got a very dense and almost scrubby texture to sure. it. Uh, I love this plant. It's what I consider to be a transitional plant. This is mm. something that can go from sun to shade. It's very different. When we think of, of ferns, we automatically think of shade, but this right. one will take you from the shade to the sun. Mm -hmm. If it's, uh, it's also quite xeric. If it's one of those plants or one of those times when it doesn't get a whole lot of water, uh, it mm -hmm. tends to curl up a bit, but then sure. with that first rain, it unfurls and just does wonderfully here. Yeah, We've had very good success with this in Xeric Gardens uh, all over Austin. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll be shocked. I'll be tromping around the hill country and, you know, caliche soils, full sun. I'll look down and I'll see a fern, and I, I believe that this may be it. I, it, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it one bit. This is wonderful for West Austin mm -hmm. soils also. It really doesn't need a very rich soil, okay. which is nice for a change. We have uh, the Ligularia as well. And mm -hmm. I think of this like the Ojo Santo, big, bold texture in the garden. It's a very big, bold texture. Uh, some people call it Farfugium. Some people call it Ligularia. Both of them are mm. terribly hard to remember. Uh, <laughs> it's also known as a giant leopard plant. Okay. Uh, very large leaves, very dense shade. Late in the summertime, it'll produce these very tall, daisy-like yellow flowers. 
Uh, even though it's known as uh, for its uh, leaf structure, it's really a lovely plant. Those almost seem like a bonus. Okay, we got. We can just have a second or two to talk about this guy right here. And I, I love black mondo grass mm -hmm. and uh, just strikingly different. What kind of growing situation does this like? It likes quite a bit of shade, but we'll also go into just a bit of sun also. Mm -hmm. A very dark black, one of the few actually black plants that we see that's not just a deep purple. And then these lovely little flowers, very easy to grow. All right, well, John, I, I appreciate so much you bringing all these cool things. Uh, it should give a lot of homeowners a lot of inspiration. So thanks again for being on the Absolutely. program. Absolutely, thanks for having me. All right, coming up next is our friend Daphne.